the micro or a meso level and uh, we'll be assuming the key themes of this uh, seminar uh, sustainability and inclusivity will be addressed at the general policy level but uh, what I will be speaking about is more of a, a top-down type of a approach to development uh, in South Asia and this is basically a, a collection of the ideas that have come and number of opportunities are emerging. So, uh, some of the in, uh, among the many opportunities available uh, to South Asia, I would like to highlight three very important opportunities that are available for individual South Asian countries. The much spoken about demographic dividend, a rise in middle class in South Asia, how South Asia could exploit that middle class, and finally, the high human mobility and the increase in remittances, how this, uh, these could be used for more effective development in South Asia. So then, <coughs> the first item, the demographic dividend. Much was spoken about it, the window of opportunity that will be open to South Asia till about 2035-2040. Now this uh, graph shows the ratio of working uh, population to the non-working population in the y-axis and the uh, year in the <coughs> x-axis. And as you can see, the darkest curve is the South Asia's, uh, is the one belonging to South Asia. So in South Asia, the working population will be rising till about 2040, whereas in China, Brazil, Indonesia, it will be declining when this working population is uh, rising. So South Asia has to make best use of this uh, demographic uh, dividend. Uh, <coughs> How can South Asia make use of this demographic dividend? Uh, yesterday we discussed about it. Countries could, because East Asia, uh, during uh, its uh, peak of development in the 70s and 80s and the 90s, it had a demographic dividend and very effectively reaped this uh, demographic dividend. And the biggest challenge for South Asia is to absorb this 1.2 billion annual addition to the labor force and effectively use that labor force for productive growth. Because if the enabling environment is not created to absorb these people and generate growth, this demographic dividend can end up as a demographic disaster. And this uh, in fact happened to one of the countries. Uh, I wouldn't say exactly it was a, a demographic disaster, but the demographic div dividend was not treated for example by Sri Lanka, which had very high basic needs indicators and if the peak of the demographic dividend was in the 70s, 80s and the 90s and the demographic dividend came to an end in 2005 in Sri Lanka. In the 70s there was a huge bulge, in fact about 50% of the population in Sri Lanka in the 70s was the youth. But there were youth insurrection in southern Sri Lanka, then later in northern Sri Lanka uh, because the policy environment was not generating the necessary jobs and re to reach the demographic dividend. Now, the next is the rise of the middle class in South Asia. Now, it, literature shows that the middle class in South Asia was about 24 million in 2000, which increased to 72 million by 2010, and it is the middle class is growing at average 12% growth rate. 4.5% of the regional population can be categorized as middle class and by 2025 the middle class population will increase to 55% of the South Asian population. And this middle class uh, encourages product differentiation and they can very effectively uh, get engaged in the overall uh, growth process by creating a virtuous circle and you can see in this uh, diagram larger middle class leads to higher consumption, higher consumption leads to higher business profits, higher business profits leads to higher savings and investment and higher investment leads to higher growth which will generate uh, additional uh, uh, um, uh, 
middle class to for this uh, virtuous circle uh, to work. So the enabling environment should be created to make best use. Policy environment has to be uh, uh, created to make best use of this emerging middle class in South Asia. Now I come to human mobility and remittances in South Asia. Studies show 24 million of the South Asian population are expected workers. India contributing uh, about 9 million, Bangladesh contributing about 7 million, Pakistan 2.4 million, Sri Lanka 1.7 million, so on and so forth, adding up to 24 million. And in fact, out of global migration, nearly 13 percent uh, comes from the South Asian region. So, how best can we make use of the remittances? Remittances amounted to about 66 billion US dollars in 2008 for the entire South Asian region and if unofficial remittances are also taken into account, this can easily increase to 75 billion or 80 billion US dollars per annum for the entire region. And as uh, all of you know, remittances is a very personal thing and it's highly uh, consumption oriented. So how do we make best use of these uh, remittances? Now increasingly think, there is thinking in South Asia to look at the migra migration remittances and the development nexus. How can we mainstream remittances to the overall development policy of South Asian countries? Because in the coming years, we will see the aging of population in the OECD countries. The working population will be declining. There will be more demand for workers, uh, especially from the South Asian region, and migration is going to increase. So how best uh, we have to have an effective strategy in place to make best use of these migrant remittances for development purposes and that also should be a component of the overall development strategy. Then related to this is the South Asia diaspora, a huge diaspora. Yesterday we spoke about uh, the non-resident Indians uh, creating a mini Silicon Valley uh, in Bangalore. Likewise, uh, how best can we make use of the diaspora? I think it was Kalpana Torcha who mentioned about diaspora bond, having this diaspora forums, etc. And they can play a key role in increasing overall investment in the South Asian region. Let us not forget, bulk of the investment in China is based on uh, the so-called round-tripping investment, which is coming from the Chinese diaspora or Chinese living in Hong Kong or Taiwan. So South Asia is also in a position to do that. In, in fact, in northern Sri Lanka today, uh, for most of the development work and foreign investment, the government is looking at the Tamil diaspora to what extent they could be a part and parcel of that development process. Now I come to the second component of this twin strategy that I uh, uh, highlighted at the beginning, that is uh, development agenda based on regional economic cooperation. And the first thing that comes to mind is how can we make use of the growing service sector in South Asia for the overall development strategy. <coughs> now, it has been uh, shown that the deficit vis-a-vis -vis India of neighboring South Asian countries in services is much less than trading goods. So uh, it's an area for cooperation and already we have the South Asia uh, Trade in Services Agreement or SATIS in place in order to make uh, best use uh, of this uh, 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 growth of the service sector. Now it has also been shown that the uh, <coughs> complementarities between among South Asian countries is much more in services than in trade. Even if you take at the very aggregate level like transport, travel, construction, communication, etc., you can see different South Asian countries uh, uh, having an edge over others in these areas. This is based on a study done by RIS in 2008. So you can just imagine at a disaggregate level uh, that the comparative advantage will uh, increase much more. And here uh, mention should be made especially about the massive growth of the service sector in India with the IT sector taking the lead. And we can uh, 
uh, envisage a situation where that can be spillovers from the IT sector growth in India to the neighboring countries and a flying geese type of a model which worked in the East Asian region based on manufacture sector growth happening in South Asia based on the services sector growth. So the, here again the, the SATIS agreement uh, has to play a key role uh, in promoting, uh, creating the enabling environment for service sector growth. While India has this advantage on uh, IT services, uh, Bangladesh having uh, comparative advantage in natural gases, Sri Lanka on uh, shipping and port services, Nepal, Maldives in tourism. So, a uh, number of complementarities that could be easily exploited. Now, in deepening economic integration, the second component that I consider important for development is the uh, regional uh, investment opportunities uh, that are coming about uh, as a result of India's growth. This is a, f uh, especially for the neighboring countries, this is a very important area. Indian growth has led to uh, quite a lot of Indian investment outside India and uh, if one looks at uh, India's investment, if we look at India's investment uh, outside India, uh, now this shows uh, investment up till 2007-2008, it was around 14 billion US dollars. Only a trickle comes from this investment to the other South Asian countries. Bulk of it is going to Europe, USA, other Asian countries. So, how can the other Asian countries benefit from uh, this uh, spillover of uh, or India's growth and India's foreign direct investment? Since Sri Lanka has a uh, bilateral free trade agreement, uh, Sri Lanka has benefited from Indian investment and happens to be the largest recipient of Indian investment among all South Asian countries. But the point I would like to emphasize is that in order to get this uh, is, uh, investment, uh, South Asia should have investment liberalization now in its agenda. It's high time that investment liberalization came into South Asia's agenda so that uh, the investment trade nexus could be exploited and intra-industry trade could be promoted which in turn will feed into increasing intra-regional trade. Yeah, I'm, I'm done. So, this is the one before the last. Uh, so, through investment liberalization, uh, through double taxation agreements, investment protection agreements, national treatment, etc., investment liberalization uh, could be initiated in South Asia. Together with this, all other areas we talked about energy integration, transport integration, the energy environment could be created to move towards a deeper integration level that is an economic. Uh, union that was articulated in the, uh, uh, the, the eminent persons group report. So, in conclusion, what I, I would like to say is that the de development agenda for South Asia should be based on individual South Asian countries creating a policy environment to gain from emerging opportunities and South Asia collectively gaining from, from other opportunities emerging under a deeper economic integration framework. Thank you.